Recording in progress. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Margaret. So nice to see you, Anne. Welcome to the PRSA College of Fellows Voices for the Future series. I'm Margaret Ann Hennen, a member of the college, and with me today is Anne Barkaloo, APR Fellow PRSA. Anne was inducted into the College of Fellows in 1990 with the second class. She is also a member of Minnesota PRSA, as am I, and we have known each other for many years in that capacity and, and through National Public Relations Society of America. Also, Anne is a co-founder with Patrick Jackson of the College of Fellows. But today we're going to talk with Anne about her incredible career as a public relations professional. And she's going to share with us some of the highlights of her career and some of the things she is most proud of. Anne? Well, I thought about it a little bit ahead of time, um, and I tried to think what are really the things I'm most proud of. And I suppose it would start with, uh, in Los Angeles County, when I was the, the chief communications officer for the countywide system, uh, 95 school districts. And we were facing, at that time, uh, the implementation of Proposition 13, which took tax revenue away from schools and put it all in one big pot. And we were facing um, mandated collective bargaining for teachers. So rapidly declining enrollment, all of these challenges. And we were hit with a really bitter teacher strike in Compton, California. And I think that was my first time to really face intense pressure and the need to keep a community informed about what was going on. So I suppose handling teacher strikes was a highlight of my career, <laughs> having to, having to, being under police protection the minute you arrive in the school district. And then uh, it was just, it was a very challenging assignment. And I felt like I grew 100%. Uh, but then Proposition 13, watching uh, school districts having to decide to close a school was a very um, intent, again, a lot of pressure on school boards, on school administrators. And as a school PR person, my job was to keep them focused on the end of the road <laughs> and uh, keep them focused on the things that were going to still be really good for kids. Uh, <clears throat> So I suppose that would be uh, also a highlight of my career. Uh, I suppose that also because of that, I became more and more active with the, first of all, the Los Angeles PRSA chapter, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I knew that, that these were people that could help me grow. And, uh, and so going to the meetings and making connections with, with some of those folks had a real impact on my growth as a professional. I also was very active in the National School Public Relations mm -hmm. Association. And and in about 1980, I think it was, I was elected the national president of that association. At the same time, Patrick Jackson was president of PRSA. And so Patrick, of course, always had a big umbrella <laughs> and started gathering all of the the heads of all the associations, the Canadian, uh, IABC, Wiki, all of the different organizations and brought us all together and said, we need to learn from each other and we need to see if there are some common things we can share. So that was the beginning of the North American Public Relations Council. And I think my message to anyone listening to this part of your collection of, of fellows' memories is that being involved with PRSA or ENSPRA or whatever professional organizations you become part of will be your best growth vehicle. It will be your master's degree, your <laughs> doctor's degree in what we do as public relations professionals. When I went into corporate America, and I got to do that because I was invited to help 
Munsingware close half of their plants in the United States without the unions coming in. And because they were a non-union manufacturer Mm -hmm. of men's golf shirts and intimate apparel for women. And it was the same kind of thing we did in closing schools. The importance of keeping a community informed, the importance of employees understanding why a plant needed to be closed was really no different than understanding why a school had to be closed. So I think it was those common experiences that that are very important. While I was at Munsingwear, though, I was asked to create the case study for PRSSA. And I thought I was going to be really, really a futurist. And so <laughs> instead of writing it all out, which had always been what PRSSA did, uh, when Betsy Plank asked me to do this, uh, I said, why don't we do it on now everyone will laugh at this, but on a tape. And so I taped the whole case study and then they sent the tape, you know, copies of the cassette tapes out to PRSSA chapters all over the country. And then they responded to listening instead of reading paragraph after paragraph about the need to close plants and asking them, giving them an assignment, a challenge of closing a plant for all the reasons that that I mentioned earlier. So that was that was really exciting because then I got to help judge. And uh, and I think that the the two guys from Wisconsin that uh, that were among the finalists drove over because they wanted after it was all over, they wanted to sit down and go over their what they had turned in. And lo and behold, um, they are still friends to this day. Wow. And uh, so that was that was quite an experience. And it was my introduction to Betsy Plank. <laughs> also uh, an experience. Was, yeah. <laughs> who, yeah, it was just also an experience because once she got you involved, she kept you involved. And uh, she was always a hero of mine. Um, I did make the move then to the corporate sector after a year at Bunsingwear. I got recruited to go to Dayton Hudson Corporation and uh, what most of the people listening today will know as Target. Mm -hmm. Uh, But used to be there was a collection of companies, including B. Dalton, which is now Barnes & Noble, and uh, a lot of department stores. Um, Well, when I arrived there, I was there about a week, and the CEO (laughs) called me into his office and said, we have an assignment for you. And I said, no, I'm just learning. I'm just getting oriented (laughs) to retail. And he said, no, I need to have you fly over to Detroit because we need to close the downtown Hudson store, one of the three largest department stores in the world, um, the home of the Thanksgiving Day Parade, uh, all kinds of things going on in Detroit. And so I flew over there, and it was, again, a lot like closing a big school. Uh, the importance of working with the mayor, the importance of, of, and Coleman Young, who was the mayor at the time, did not take kindly to the idea (laughs) of this big department store being closed. But the fact is that consumers had dictated that because they preferred shopping at shopping centers Mm -hmm. and not, and not going downtown anymore. And so if you have no business, then you have no choice. Uh, but we did manage to keep the store windows dressed and uh, so that the, the structure itself did not become an ugly structure in downtown Detroit. Uh, but again, that was, a, that was my first challenge at Dayton Hudson, and I'm very <laughs> proud of how we handled that. But following that, there were lots of challenges. As you know, we faced, the, um, we faced a threatened takeover, and so mm-hmm. we had to work with the legislature in Minnesota to to get them to pass a law that would keep Minnesota companies uh, safe from anyone without real money behind an offer to take it over. You can't just sort of have pie in the sky and say you want to take over a company. After we got through that, after we, as we used to always say, kept Dayton Hudson whole, um, well, then we got faced with a challenge from a grant to Planned Parenthood that we had withdrawn uh, a grant, and um, and then 
the people that were supporting Planned Parenthood uh, called for a boycott of our stores. Uh, they turned in 9,000 cut up credit cards in the first week. Oh my. Uh, so it was a real business challenge. And the boycott that was called in on, on our stores was to take place on the day after Thanksgiving, which is of course <laughs> the biggest day of the year. Of so again, we had to really work to be sure that communities in 38 states at the time understood what having Dayton Hudson in, in your state meant uh, to the state. So we we created brochures for every state. And you have to understand that all this took place before computers <laughs> and before iPhones. And we were still using fax machines. And we had to have things printed and then drop shipped all over the country. But we came through that again with with our company intact and our customer base solid. So I'm very proud of, of how we pulled our resources together and um, made all of that happen. I think selling companies was also a challenge as we began to consolidate. I was always the one that got sent out <laughs> to uh, tell the folks at, at Pickwick Books that we were going to sell their company and it's sort of like saying to your children, okay, now we're just going to shut this family down and find new homes for all of you. And the, the executives would always make the announcement of what we were going to do. And then they would say, now, Ann will stay here and help you work through how to handle all this. So uh, that was, there were always lots of challenges, but I loved that. I think it kept me growing. Uh, at the same time, I was very active in Minnesota PRSA, yes, as Margaret Ann already mentioned. And I think, again, I want to stress the importance of, of being involved in those professional associations. It's better than any graduate course you could take at any university. Uh, going to the conferences and listening to uh, the experts. When I got we got challenged with um, some contaminated products in one of our stores the year after the, the Tylenol crisis. Mm -hmm. And I called Larry Foster and he was able to, he said, I'm about to conduct a PRSA workshop in Chicago on how we handle it. And I immediately got on a plane and flew down <laughs> and listened to his workshop. Again, an incredible opportunity. Um, and then I got to spend a lot of time with him and became a, a very, very good friends after that uh, as well, because it wasn't, he just didn't share with me the challenges they faced with Tylenol. He stayed with me. You know, he'd call occasionally as we had some contaminated toothpaste. Uh, back in the day when department stores had departments that sold mm -hmm. things like drugstores sold. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and then uh, contaminated eye drops in Colorado uh, in our Target stores. And so these were all challenges that come along that, that, that sometimes the best way to handle them is to listen to someone who's been through it before. And those those opportunities, I think, come through our professional associations. So I'm very proud of, of my connections to the, the to PRSA, to the National School of Public Relations, to the PR seminar, um, to all the wonderful, incredible groups that at the Page Society, uh, all the groups that I've been able to be part of. That network has certainly been right. active and important in your life. And in addition to, as you so, so strongly stated, uh, the importance of being part of membership of a professional group, is there any other advice that you would give to young professionals or actually professionals at any stage in their career? Oh, I think the opportunity to just stay in touch with other professionals. You know, here in Minnesota, we have a past presidents group that gets together several times a year. And, uh, and I think all those connections um, are very important to, to keep us growing. And, and even when we're retired, um, I mean, I still stay very much involved with, uh, with groups here in, here in Minnesota, the, the Twin City Communications Council is a group that Dave Mona and I sort of brought back to life. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a group of 
of the top, the senior most executive, public relations executives in corporations, the professional uh, sports teams, and all the media. And we meet together once a month to learn from each other, to get smarter. We always say that our goal is at the end of every session is to be smarter than we were when we came. So I think staying staying involved with opportunities that keep us getting smarter is very important. I agree. There are times, <laughs> how, there are times however, that I wish the government would call and ask my advice. <laughs> really? They could use you, Anne. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I worry sometimes about how, how they're communicating. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That importance of communicating and the importance of talking to people. You had you worked with so many organizations that had multiple locations. That kind of is a special um, challenge, I think. What what did you find most um, most challenging of that kind of thing, both in Los Angeles and with Dayton Hudson? I think helping uh, helping the media understand who the corporation was mm -hmm. and who the, or who the company was located in the Midwest, uh, which was always referred to as flyover land. And mm -hmm. so we had to work because we were um, traded on the New York Stock Exchange. We had to be known by by all the the influential financial people in New York and all the media people on the East Coast and the West Coast. And so they were more used to stores that they could shop in, uh -huh. uh, things that they could experience where they lived, as opposed to where we were located throughout the Midwest. Uh, I think those challenges uh, were always, so it's, it meant that, that I did a lot of, of flying to New York and mm -hmm. getting to meet people and, and uh, helping them understand my company and the things we were interested in doing. And expanding your knowledge as well, I, yes. I would assume. Yes. Oh, Anne, I know we could talk for hours and hours yes. because this is only the teeniest little bit about your incredibly yes. exemplary career. But is there anything- oh, I'm, I'm so thrilled you asked me to be oh, part of it. It wouldn't be complete without you. Is there anything Thank that you. we haven't talked about this morning that we should have talked about? Well, I, I suppose, uh, there's one other thing uh -huh. um, that, I, that I think is important, and that is that we use our skills outside of what we get paid to do. Mm -hmm. um, and my, I will give you one experience that I'm sure you will remember, but um, Dayton Hudson always prided itself on its officers being involved with organizations that it supported. And because of my background in education as a teacher and as a school PR person, uh, when the Children's Theater had an, had the opportunity, had an opening on their board, uh, the foundation asked me if I would serve on that board, and I did. And about a month after I got on the board, I was attending a function where I learned that the artistic director had just been arrested um, on the suspicion of the of abuse of young children, uh, primarily boys, and the executive and the artistic director was a man. And uh, this was sort of unheard of uh, at the whole at that point in time. And so my job was to get I immediate like a like a war horse, you know, I said, listen, <laughs> we got to get a PR group together here. And so we did. And I ended up chairing the board for two years through that crisis. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important for us to use our skills, not just in what we're paid to do, but in opportunities that we have that we're not paid for. Thank you, Anne. What wonderful advice. It's been a delight to talk with you and thank you for being part of our series. Thank you, Margaret Ann. Bye-bye.